State Department form. Ambassador to the United Nations Madeleine Albright is scheduled to discuss events in Bosnia and Haiti. And that's the C-SPAN program schedule. Next, from Holyoke, Massachusetts, live coverage of a debate for the U.S. Senate. The candidates, incumbent Democrat Edward Kennedy and his Republican opponent Mitt Romney. This is the second debate between the two candidates for this race. This debate was organized by the Boston Globe and Boston Herald and is expected to run about an hour. Massachusetts. We're coming to you live from the Holyoke Community College for a town meeting discussion of the issues. This event is being sponsored by the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald and it's being carried live statewide on televisions and radio stations as well as nationally on C-SPAN. Now before we introduce the candidates, just a couple of notes about the format tonight. As you can see, a 12-member citizen panel is here on stage to pose the questions. My job is basically to play traffic cop to make sure that each candidate receives approximately the same amount of airtime during this hour, and also to try and keep the discussion both focused and moving. And for those of you who watched the debate on Tuesday night and are thinking to yourselves, good luck, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because we do have 12 questioners and just a limited amount of time, I should also tell you that we have asked our audience members here at Holyoke Community College to please not respond during the discussion itself, to hold their applause until the end of the event for the candidates' closing statements. They have graciously agreed. We're going to hold them to that. So if you don't hear any response at home, it isn't that the crowd suddenly doesn't disagree or agree with what the candidates are saying. They're simply doing what we've asked them to do. And now, before we begin the questions, a brief introduction of the two candidates. Senator Edward Kennedy has served in the U.S. Senate since 1962. He is a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Virginia Law School. Mitt Romney is managing director of Bain Capital, a venture capital firm in Boston. He is a graduate of Brigham Young University, Harvard Law School, and the Harvard Business School. Gentlemen, the voters tell us that they want substance, that they want specifics, so let's do our best to oblige. And since we are here at Holyoke Community College, we thought it appropriate to begin with a question from one of our student questioners, Jennifer Miskowski. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Miskowski, and I'm in this, my second year here at Holyoke Community College. My question is posed towards Mr. Romney. A lot of stress has been put on education recently. The Republican proposal to increase costs of student loans calls for the possibility of cuts on Perkins loans, work study, and supplemental grants. Although half of this savings would be given to the Pell Grant program, the remaining one half would be put toward deficit reduction. Given the rising cost of higher education, do you think that it would be beneficial to approve such a contract, and would you approve one if elected? Have you got one of those, I hope? <laughs> That's tough. Uh, let me tell you, in my view, it is not a good idea to go into a contract like, like what was organized by the Republican Party in Washington, laying out a whole series of things which the party said, these are the things we're going to do. I think that's a mistake. I think instead that if you want to get something done in Washington, you don't end up picking teams with Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other, entering into a contract and saying, okay, we're all going to do this, and then if, of course, that works, then the other side feels like they're the loser. But if it wins, they feel like the winner. I don't like winners and losers in Washington. I'd rather say let's get together and work together. In my view, if we're going to have cost reduction and reduce our budget deficit, we're going to have to sit down with people on both sides of the aisle and work through the various numbers. I'm not in favor of reducing the loan program in colleges and universities. I think that's a mistake. I think we can continue to provide the loans necessary for students across the country. I also think that the Pell Grant program works and should continue to be supported. I would have supported the most recent education bill. I think that also is helpful to the education in our secondary and elementary schools. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the question is where this country is going on the student loan program and the student uh, grant program. In 1960, in the early 1960s, three quarters of all aid and assistance to students were the grant programs. One quarter were the loan programs. During the period of the Republican administration, that was reversed. 
So we had three quarters of the loan uh, uh, help and assistance were for the loan programs and one quarter for the grant programs. That's why so many of the students that are in this hall are going into debt like they are and so many other students across Massachusetts. The question was, are we, as we move towards a direct loan program, which means that the students can borrow at the same rate of the federal government, which can mean four to eight billion dollars more, will we pass that benefit on to the students or use it for deficit reduction? We use four billion of deficit reduction uh, in the president's program. I thought that was one of the toughest kinds of reductions uh, for the deficit reduction because we could, should have passed that on uh, to the students. And the real kind of question is, is whether the Republicans are going to keep their hands off that uh, program in the future and let the benefit go to the students. That's where it ought to go. We provided some savings for the students, but we ought to provide it a great deal more if we are expecting our young people not to end up in extraordinary indebtedness uh, in our country. Jennifer, you have a follow-up? I believe, already, <laughs> Um, the middle class students who are not um, poor enough to get aid but do not have enough money to, um, to pay tuition fully, do you have any, any plans for that? Well, that's the loan program. And that's where we have to, we have to get loans for students that don't, have, don't qualify for aid but are able to get loans. We have student loan, loan programs and, and I think that's something which is, should be available to students of middle incomes and lower incomes. But the real tough issue that we face, and the Senator talks about, you know, are we going to give the benefit to the students? Let's all raise our hands. We want to give the benefits to the students. We want to increase education spending. We want to increase health care spending. We want to increase all forms of spending for all the good things we'd like to do. But ultimately, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Because the middle class of this country is becoming overwhelmed with taxes. And we're also passing along to our children and our grandchildren massive government debts, a national debt of four and a half trillion dollars. When you get out of college, you'll have over $18,000 worth of debt you didn't know about. And that's your share of the national debt. We're going to have to make some tough decisions. I think the way to do that is for people in both parties to sit down, have a spending reduction commission, look at all the programs that we love, and say, to balance the budget by this date, here's what we've got to do. Look at those alternatives, make the tough decision. I wish I could just say, we can give it forever. Mr. Romney, we need to move on. Do you want a could quick it, Just a, a brief a question. It, we provide $2,300 under the Pell Grants. The loan programs can go up to $65,000, which uh, makes available loans to hardworking families, particularly those that may have two or three children uh, that are attending uh, higher uh, education. So we have expanded that. And one of the things I did in the last higher ed bill is eliminate the value of homes to be considered into the total assets of a family's uh, income because we in Massachusetts saw the rise uh, in the estimates of the value of people's homes. And when the value of the homes went up, it meant uh, that their sons and daughters would not be eligible either for the Pell Grant or for the loan programs. We've eliminated that, and as a result, 100,000 more students in Massachusetts are eligible for either the Pell Grants or for the Stafford Loans. That's progress. It's not as much as any of us would like, but uh, education has to be a main priority. 65% of all the students that are in here tonight get some kind of loan or assistance program, and we can't have them indebted. And that's one of the reasons as well that we have provided an income contingency so you could repay the loan on the basis of your income. So if you wanted to be a teacher and make $28,000, you could say, I'll pay 5% of that income or 7% of that income and know that you can meet your obligations without feeling totally emerged in, uh, in repaying uh, a debt for the rest of your life. That was a very important change that we made this year. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Does anyone else, as long as we're talking about education, is anyone else ready with an education question or shall we move on to another topic? Hi, I'm Betty Tefangshin from Situate, Massachusetts. And mine is education related, but it starts off with uh, some of the things that you said the other night on the crime. And I thought that you were being too simplistic in saying that things like sentencing were the main problem. And I think that uh, with recent uh, research on child development, children develop their uh, personalities and their study skills and their self-esteem before the age of three. And this is uh, 
once they have established this, then it determines how they do in school, how they do in their careers, and how they do in life. So the question and, is? So the question is, um, how uh, could you help these people so that they could develop, you know, from this age into uh, productive uh, citizens? And you're directing this to? To both of you. Okay, let's see. I believe Mr. Romney went first last time. Mr. Kennedy? Uh, the, uh, the Carnegie Commission uh, published uh, its reports uh, uh, just about uh, nine months ago. And for the first time, even though they have been reporting on where children are in our society, they pointed out the medical implications of failing to pr provide nutrition and nurturing for children from the one to three period. And that it has a metabolic effect and impact on child's ability uh, to develop as they enter into school. Uh, it was always considered to be a sensitive uh, time, but this is the first time we have extended Head Start programs from zero to three. So we can have services for the expectant mother and also uh, parenting skills for single mothers that need those kind of skills, but to try and make sure that there's the range of social and health services for those children during that period of time. Enormously sensitive uh, period of time. It's difficult enough for children in our school systems today to make it with all the various complexities of life. But if they don't get that kind of nurturing as well as the uh, support during that one and a half to three year period, it's virtually impossible for children to make it. And that's a top priority. It starts in the home. For those years you're talking about, you're talking about a home. And in my view, every study has proven that we need to have two parents in the home if you really want to have the kids learning ready. And we've got to change our welfare system to make sure we're not subsidizing kids having kids so we can get two parents in the home. And we've got to do something in our schools to teach kids the benefits of having a family before you have kids, being a husband and wife. That's part one. But part two, this is a different world than it was in the 1960s when I was growing up when you used to be able to have mom at home and dad at work. Now mom and dad both have to work whether they want to or not and usually one of them has two jobs. And if that's the case, we're gonna to have to have good child care in the community. Some years ago, an idea was brought to me to start a child care center, not off where people live, but where people work, so that if the kid got sick during the middle of the day, mom or dad could take care of the child. And that is something which we helped create, a company called Bright Horizons. Now with over 40 centers, it takes care of thousands of children. And the moms who work there have been ranked in uh, working mother uh, job of the year for the last four years in a row of the top 100 companies. That is, in my view, essential to providing the kind of nurturing preschool care. In addition to the government programs we can do, like Head Start, it is also providing the very best in quality of private daycare facilities. We've been talking about working families here, and, and since we have spent some time on education, I'm afraid we're going to need to move on. Who has a working families issue or question? <laughs> Mr. Pons? <laughs> All right, you want to change to affordable housing? All right, let's change to affordable housing. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. My name is Juan Carlos Pons. Affordable housing is a great concern for Americans today. Owning a home is next to impossible for many working families. In 1990, a housing trust fund for hotel workers in the greater Boston area was created. This initiative alone send the message of hope to the entire country. Can this type of private sector affordable housing be duplicated in other parts of the state and country? And what is your philosophy around this type of initiative? I'm not familiar with the specific housing program that you're talking about, but the answer is yes, we can create private pools of capital that help create new housing projects. We're, we desperately need more housing availability in our country. How do we go about uh, bringing in that housing. Well, we do have some help from government, but I don't want to go back to the days of big government projects. That didn't work. Those things have been a disaster. Some of them have been torn down because they just didn't work. In many cases where we still have that public housing stock available, I'd like to turn that over to tenants. I'd like to turn that over to the people living there, not as a gift, but give them a mortgage, let them work their way out of and uh, work their way into home ownership in those projects. That's one way of getting, uh, of getting capital there. Secondly, in areas that we don't have capital, 
places that people are not willing to build in our cities where we don't have sufficient private mor uh, mortgage money that will go there, we can provide guarantees through our community banks and through government loans to be, or for, through government guarantees to make sure that people will loan to people who can otherwise not build in those community areas. Uh, Jim Johnson, who is the head of the Fannie Mae, uh, announced about six months ago that uh, Fannie Mae, which is the principal mortgage instrument, was going to invest a trillion five hundred billion dollars nationwide. And two weeks ago, he, he came up to Boston. Uh, he announced it would be a billion five hundred million dollars over a ten-year period just in Boston. Now that is, in and of itself, is not enough. What you're going to have to do is leverage a lot of the pension funds, for example. Uh, particularly interested in organized labor, now is involving themselves and using those kinds of funds to really move towards home ownership. The objective has to be home ownership. We find there's an entirely different context for a family if they own their own home. And now at last we have the principal loan agency that was dormant over the last 12 years active and involved. That is the kind of initiative. We don't have the great capital resources do not appear to be available in terms of the regular banking system. This is the kind of initiative which has to be encouraged. It's on the move. It has to be uh, supported. Uh, but I'm uh, very excited about the announcement. I know Mayor Menino uh, is very excited uh, about it. And uh, we ought to be building on that and working. So it's not only in Boston, but it's going to be uh, around in our cities as a major instrument for cities all over Massachusetts and all over the country. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Professor Hamilton? What's your question? Yes, uh, I'm Bob Hamilton from Adams. Uh, a gentleman, uh, in the next 10 days, maybe tonight, I've got to make up my mind which one of you I'm going to hire <laughs> as, as the Senate. And uh, I'd like to address both of you, but sort of separately. I'd like to start with you, uh, Senator Kennedy. I first met and uh, talked with you back in 1962. I remember very well. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, in North Adams at the uh, that, Fall that, Foliage Festival. That's six elections in about three decades. Well, I think you'll have to agree we both have changed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up, but... Uh... Now, the world has changed also. And I think uh, Congress is self-centered and meaner than ever. And the Senate would rather filibuster and stall than enact beneficial legislation for the, for the country. And many people are cynical. And the mood seems to be get rid of the old codgers. Or just anything new is better than the old. And the question is? And my question is, Senator, how will you change with the times? How will you keep up? Uh, with the polarization and the divisiveness in, in Washington? And what changes will you make in your statesmanship style? Well, that's, that's a very uh, thoughtful question. And uh, uh, it deserves a, a really a very thoughtful uh, response and answer. Let me just mention a bit of what uh, my experience was in the last Congress, where we were able to fashion coalitions, bipartisan coalitions. Uh, we fashioned a coalition in terms of addressing the Head, Head Start program that I've just mentioned. Uh, we fashioned a coalition, bipartisan coalition, on the Goals 2000 that will provide 85% of all federal funding into local communities to let reform of education bubble up. We fashioned coalition Republicans alike in our School to Work program to help the 65 or 70% of high school students who do not go on to college in a fine school like this to find uh, meaningful employment. And we find a coalition uh, in our national service programs, all uh, very, very uh, important. I hope that we can find similar coalitions, particularly in the areas of health care and health care reform. Uh, this, I think, uh, uh, happens in the Congress when we're at our best. And uh, hopefully, uh, that'll be something that uh, I will try to the extent that I can, and I've had good success of doing it uh, in the health care area and also in streamlining our job training programs in the next Congress. Senator, I have to stop you there, and also let me advise you, Professor Hamilton, that Mr. Romney's now about a minute behind, and so you can take a slightly longer uh, take on, on this next question. If you can ask it quickly, please. Uh, I'll try to. Mr. Romney, uh, I'm looking at two resumes, 
and they show about the same education. Neither of you uh, answered or participated in the 1994 National Political Awareness Test. Now, you uh, have about 10 years uh, collecting and, and spending money, and I guess that's something like what the Senate does. But what <laughs> bothers me is Much, yeah. you're asking me to hire you uh, sort of on-the-job on the training, like they say in basketball, I take you on as a project. And what I'd like to know is, <laughs> what I'm a good are, project, when, I assure you. What, uh, just tell me your skills to be an effective senator. Well, you started off by saying, how would the senator change with the times? My skills are particularly attuned to the times. If you look at what's happening in America today and in Massachusetts, you see jobs leaving, you see companies leaving. Why is that? What's happening? There are new industries around the world developing. We're going to have to create new industries in Massachusetts to compete. New small businesses are going to have to grow and employ people. And the companies that we have here are going to have to be, become more competitive to keep jobs here. The best social program is a good job. We can talk all about the social programs that are enacted in Washington and the coalitions that are carried out in Washington, but unless we can create and build strong industries and good, strong, small businesses, we don't have a future. My whole experience, my whole background is working with small businesses and large ones, competing around the world, knowing how to help find the ones that can make it in Massachusetts, bringing them here, finding capital for them, helping cut through government red tape so they can grow and develop the very skills that I believe are necessary in our country going into the next century are the kinds of skills I've developed over the last 20 years, and that's why I'm running. All right, thank you, Professor sure. Hamilton. And who uh, in the, who in the uh, back row? I, I'm sorry, okay. we have to keep moving. Um, who would like to be next? Jeffrey Work? Yes, uh, Hold on, let me get up there. <laughs> If uh, Mr. Romney is behind on time, I, I happen to have a question uh, directed only to him. Um, uh, you touched earlier on a subject that I think is a sore subject for uh, Americans around the country, and that is the, the subject of gridlock. One of the most frustrating aspects of the last session of Congress was the Republicans party, Republican Party's incessant use of the filibuster as an obstructionist tactic. Senator Kennedy seems to have a better reputation than many of his fellow Democrats for working on both sides of the political aisle. And in Tuesday's debate, you said, I'm not going to Washington as a partisan politician. Should the voters of Massachusetts, therefore, believe that you would vote to end such filibusters against the wishes of party leaders like Robert Dole, Phil Graham, and Newt Gingrich? And should we believe your voting record will be significantly different from the Republican Party line? Depends on the issue, but the answer is yes. I'm not going to Washington to toe the line. That is not what I'm doing. I'm, look, I've given up too much in running in this race to think I'm going down there to be some party politician for any party. I'm going to Washington because I care very deeply about what's happened to this country. I am very concerned about the direction we're headed in and believe we have to change it. I'm going to go to Washington to give everything I can to try and turn us in a different direction. I can't do it alone. I'm going to do it with people on both sides of the aisle. I'm going to do it with the president. I think the president does a lot of things that make a lot of sense. I'll support him in many ways. I hope he gets changed, but I'll still support him while he's there for the next two years. But I believe that the issues we face are far too important to be faced only from one side of the aisle or the other. If I may follow up, uh, are there particular specific issues that you have differences with the Republican Party platform? And if yes. so, could you elaborate on them for us here? Well, for instance, uh, on, the, on the crime bill, I supported the crime bill that was in the Senate. Uh, it went through a number of iterations. When it came time to vote for it in the final bill in the Senate, there were some Republicans that didn't want to go ahead, that wanted to fight for a filibuster. I disagreed with that. I thought it made sense to proceed with the crime bill. I said so. Likewise, uh, uh, the, we're going we're to have some differences on certain things like capital gains taxes. You're not going to see me standing up and fighting to get capital gains taxes. Some things I'll agree with, but other things I'll disagree with. Thank you. All right. Would you like to go? Gentlemen? Senator Kennedy, thank you for insisting that this debate be held in Western Massachusetts. Sometimes we feel that public officials ignore us in this part of the state. Mr. Romney, in the debate on Tuesday, you said that you had traveled the entire state from Boston to Worcester. Does this mean that you, does this mean that you do not consider the Connecticut Valley and the Berkshires as part of the Commonwealth? This suggests to me that if elected, you will ignore the needs of citizens in the western geographical half of the state. Have you personally ever been to Adams? 
Mrs. Hamilton, you're being tough on me now. Yes. <laughs> well, now let me tell you the rest of the story. I have visited Adams, and I've visited North Adams, and I've visited Pittsfield, and I've visit, oh, yeah. visited Lenox. Well, they're in the paper, and I've visited... Uh, the answer is yes. Now, let me, right. let me keep going. In the last... Since January, I have, I have been west of Worcester every single week. Now, I've also, let me, and it's one thing to visit during a campaign year, let me tell you. What's going to happen after the campaign year is far more important to Western Mass than what's going to happen in the campaign year. Because we all come around in the campaign year. And I've made this commitment. Because I believe the key to what's needed in Western Mass is more good jobs. I'm not going to have my only office in Boston. I'm going to have an office in Western Massachusetts, and I mean Springfield or Pittsfield or Lenox. I'm not going to be back in Boston saying, if you have a, pr a problem or a concern, why don't you come into Boston to see me? I will have an office in Western Massachusetts. I'll have an office in Southeastern Massachusetts and one in Boston. For heaven's sake, uh, uh, Congressman Blute has three offices, and he's only uh, got a congressional budget to, uh, to work with. And I will have three offices and make sure that Western Massachusetts is represented by the United States Senator. Do you have a follow-up? you want to ask Senator no. Kennedy when he was there? Yes, just, I know. Let, let, <laughs> let me just say I'm uh, glad to be uh, back at, at Holyoke College. This is my fifth time here. We had a very good conference uh, about a year and a half ago when we were implementing the Americans with Disability Act. And uh, Holyoke Commute College is uh, one of the best in the state in terms of involving those uh, young people who have uh, some very special uh, special needs. and was once again the leader in, uh, in, our, uh, in our Commonwealth. Uh, clearly, uh, this, uh, this part of the state, our western part of the state, are the key parts uh, to it. I think most of the people here uh, in, uh, in Holyoke, as well as in the western part of the state, know uh, both my uh, involvement and interest and commitment uh, to uh, not only Holyoke, the western part of the state, and I always uh, look forward to attending to their, its needs, as well as enjoying its beauty. All right, if we keep moving along, perhaps we might have a chance for a few of you at least to ask other questions. Gentlemen, good evening. I am Shaina Pollins from the YWCA of Western Massachusetts. My job is case manager of the Pregnant Adolescent Girls Education Program. Um, and my question is directed towards welfare reform. Uh, the campaign, Mr. Romney, if I can direct it to you first, sir, has uh, consistently, we've heard change. Uh, positive change, we hope, negative change, we see. My question is this, in a time where society has mixed reviews on the welfare system, what measures do you support under your proposed welfare reform will ensure that the citizens of the state of Massachusetts do not become victims of regressive social policies as we have in the past when national wealth was consolidated into fewer hands, and what, when do you plan to enforce? Well, let me tell you about the, the welfare changes I'd make right away. The, the plan is not working, as, and, and you see the same thing. We're, we're creating more problems than we're solving, and it's also costing an enormous amount for the un, entire country. The, the means-tested program is around $300 billion for the country. So what do we have to do? In my view, the heart of the welfare program is not just to care for people in need but it's also to help get them back into the workforce. That is how you show your real love and respect for people. And that's, that we're not doing. So I start by saying, I'm gonna reform a system, and instead of just saying, how can I get everybody the money they need to take care of themselves, how can I also make sure they get back to work? In my view, one way of doing that is to say not only that everyone has to go to work and that, and, 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 and that there are certain time periods by which that must happen, but also saying, I'm gonna make it easier and more attractive for employers to hire people on welfare and train them. I'm an employer in Massachusetts. I've worked with uh, several small businesses here. I know that it's more difficult to hire someone who's never had a job before, who's on welfare. It's easier to hire someone who's been unemployed. I want to br bring a tax credit to companies that are willing to hire and train people on welfare because I want to give people what they really want, the dignity of a very good job. Uh, first of all, there's already a tax credit on the books. It's not working very well. We have to review it and, and change it and alter it, and I think it ought to be something on the table. But the one thing that I will never be a part of is a kind of cruel system that's going to take uh, welfare out on children. Uh, we hear a great deal about uh, mothers being to blame. What about deadbeat dads? What about their meeting their responsibility? 
to those children. Uh, I'm all for able-bodied people who can work, should work. But we also have to get at some of the other matters if we're really going to deal with the, the whole issue of dependency. It's amazing to me that so many hard-working men and women uh, continue to work because they don't have health care for their children, they don't have daycare, uh, and they don't have any kind of training. If they fall into the welfare system, they get their health care for their children. And then in some instances even get daycare. We ought to have the able-bodied people ought to work. But we're also going to have to take care of children in any system. And any system that's going to be worthy of being called reform is going to have to provide training for single mothers, it's going to have to have some daycare, and it's also going to have to meet the issues of health care. That's how many of these issues which I'm involved in really come together. The health care reform, the education and training programs, the other kinds of jobs and employment programs, and that's why I think I can be really effective in the next Congress in dealing in a responsible way with the uh, welfare reform, but always sensitive to the very special needs of children in our society. Are you happy with those, or you want to ask a follow-up? I take it just a step further. Um, if, if I can target a particular group, the children in the welfare system, uh, the children covers the small, the babies, the toddlers, and it, it uh, covers our teenagers. I'd like to focus a minute on our teenage pregnant girls. How will your reform ensure that they not continue to live in poverty? Let, let me begin by saying something about what's, what Senator Kennedy said. I couldn't agree more about the need to take care of our children, but I couldn't disagree more with regards to his ability to get the job done. He's been there 32 years. He, do, he does know the inside and out of the program. He knows not only the, the trees and the forest, but he knows the leaves one by one. And in my view, the last thing we need is to have someone who's been there all this time forming this plan, trying to reform it one more time. The Family Support Act, which is one that was passed in 1988, was to, supposed to get people back to work. It didn't. It led to an increase in welfare roles. How do we take care of the young kids? How do we take care of teenagers? In my view, the governor's plan is an excellent one. It says that young girls who become pregnant will stay with their moms and their dads if they have a home to live with. It also says we're going to go after the father of that child, make sure that the father helps pay for part of the cost. And if the father is a minor and has no income, we'll go after his parents. We're going to make sure that we get all the parties participating in helping take care of that mom and that child. It is not fair for the girls of America to be taking responsibility and take the full burden of these children. Those fathers are needed as well. Folks, remember, thank you. Senator Kennedy, do you... Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact uh, remains that uh, with regards to teenage mothers, if you're not going to build into a system the preventive programs to give individuals, teenage uh, girls, a sense of self-worth and self-value. If you think that you're going to be able to have a, a recriminatory kind of a system and a strong penal system, you're going to fail. You have to provide the kind of self-value and worth for young people, young women. And that has to start at the earliest of ages with nurturing, uh, with enhancing both educational opportunity, with the mentoring programs and systems and help. Uh, it's an uh, it's enormous uh, kind of challenge. There are no easy answers. I thought we were going to, tonight, to try and take, uh, respond to these questions. And uh, Mr. Romney, if there had been a simple, the answer to the 88 a answer is the Republicans wouldn't fund it. Senator, there, I was no, just there are no easy answers, but there are wrong answers. There are wrong answers, and that's what you've been doing gentlemen, for 32 years. Gentlemen, excuse me. Excuse me. We only have 10 minutes to the closing arguments, and we have several more yeah, questions. Sure. So if you could just quickly finish your thoughts, Senator, and we'll keep moving. You know, you have uh, today, out of the Dimmick, uh, Senator, I visited children who have HIV. One of the great uh, tragic uh, circumstances. Mothers trying to work with them. Uh, there are no simple answers. That was a problem that we never faced five or seven or ten years ago. So we have to stay at it. We have to look at how we're going to get to the root cause, which I think is the value of a young teenage uh, girls, uh, as well as do the other changes in our programs. Okay. Sorry, we'll have to leave it there. I know there were several questions about foreign policy, which is something which has been almost ignored through the campaign. Uh, Mr. Pons, you've already asked a question. Yes, over here. 
Hello, my name is Chuck Wagers and I'm from West Newbury. I have a foreign policy question which should be a lot easier to answer. <laughs> After the, since the Cold War has ended, we seem to be getting more and more involved with smaller skirmishes. And it seems to me that we're going to be asked more often to send in, foreign send in American troops into foreign lands. And I'd like to know each of your positions on that. And secondly, do you think that we have to have a consensus of the UN in order to intervene? Or do you feel that we should uh, do, it, do it alone? Uh, who would you like to take this Both first? gentlemen. Okay, who first? Uh, Mr. Romney. Okay. Chuck, uh, in my view, the United States should intervene by itself when there are national interests of a substantial nature that we have in that theater or in that conflict. And so if we have citizens' lives at risk, if our economy is at risk in a serious way, or if our national security is at risk, we have the right to go in whether or not the United Nations wants to do it. We should do that. And we've done it. The great uh, defining moment in our history where we, uh, in the last uh, most recent time, where we had to make that decision was, was with regards to Desert Storm. Were we going to protect our interests, protect Israel, protect our economy by sending in our troops and risking the lives of our men and women? We took a tough decision. The president decided to do so. Senator Kennedy voted no. I would have voted yes. Now we had another decision recently, which is were we going to invade Haiti, unilaterally step in and invade it? In my view, that did not justify the risk of lives of American men and women. We did not have that substantial U.S. interest at stake. And for that reason, I would not have invaded. I was delighted that the President took a very wise move and sent in President Clinton, Senator Nunn, and also Colin Powell, and they were able to avert an invasion. That is something I supported. With the uh, end of the uh, Cold War, it's really uh, like a pressure cooker across the world where client states of both the United States and the Soviet Union kept the pressure on their various satellite nations. And now, since that Cold War has ended, you see these various pressure points growing up all over the world, and we are working in a new framework to try and sort of deal with it. Clearly, it's much better if we deal with it in a multinational way. Uh, if we want to constrain, not have the United States the policemen of the world, it's better to get other countries involved so that the United States will not be involved in every place around the world. There may be circumstances where our national interest is required. One of the great balances that our founding fathers gave us is on the war-making powers, the war-making powers described in the Constitution to give be with the Congress. On the other hand, the, con the founding fathers gave the commander-in-chief role a special responsibility. So there is a blur, like many other constitutional issues, the Establishment Clause and the, and the Free Exercise Clause on the questions of prayer. So there, there is this, uh, this blend, but I uh, think that the President has done well. The Soviet Union has not dissolved. Well, <laughs> Sorry to stop you, but we have uh, three more people who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet. Hi, my name is Phil Warren, uh, Vice President of the Student Center here and President of the African American Club. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, as far as foreign policy, I think that uh, we should really focus on the people here and uh, first, because there's a lot of atrocities going on in our country, uh, and we need to focus on those. Uh, as far as Massachusetts, uh, we, you both uh, said that you're going to be tough on crime uh, if elected or if re-elected, and uh, we here on campus would like to know that uh, whether or not crime is really the problem here because uh, we've been going over this issue for about 12 years, maybe longer, and it seems uh, that we get tougher and tougher and tougher, but things get worse and worse and worse. So the question is? So the question is, uh, are there other circumstances that are contributing to our crime problem? And if there aren't, could you elaborate? And if there are, could you elaborate? Uh, I'll let Mr. Kennedy go first, and I'd like to hear Mr. Romney's view also. Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, those individuals who are going to commit crimes of violence have to be uh, dealt with uh, certainly and uh, effectively, and they have to be sentenced, and there has to be truth in sentencing. I was the author of the Truth in Sentencing Bill that passed in 1986, also with regard to bail reform, to be able to retain individuals who have a predilection of violence and who are arrested and also violent juvenile offenders. Now, I think all of those are important. We are just seeing those, we only have 85,000 
uh, prisoners in the federal prison. The real problem is in the state and local communities. They have a million three hundred thousand. That is where the principal problems are. It's going to be in the states and local. But the, now we find the states uh, in terms of the truth and sentencing following what we have done. But your question raises something which is enormously important, and that is, what are we trying to do to, to provide prevention to crime, to catch young people before they commit the uh, act? And we fought for that in the United States uh, uh, Senate. It was considered by some to be pork uh, among uh, the opposition uh, party. But what it does is basically, whether it's violence against a, a women's issue, or whether it's the anti-gang activity, or after-school programs, try to develop a variety of different programs to catch young people, particularly before they enter a life of crime. Mr. Romney, you have an extra minute here. Um, you fall oh, behind boy. once again, so you can go a little longer. <laughs> well, let me tell you. First, I think we have to be tougher. You say, gee, we're, st we're being tough, and uh, we're, still, uh, we're still seeing people on the street. We're not being tough enough. I've been to, to uh, courthouses and watched people come in having been accused of violent crimes. They admit that they have done them and they're, they're given a suspended sentence. That means they're given a sentence that they don't serve at all. We have to be tougher. We have to have the jail space so we can be tougher. I'm in favor of mandatory sentences. So is the senator. But when it came to a vote this year on whether there would be a mandatory sentence put down on people who use guns in the commission of crimes, he was the tie-breaking vote to say no. When it came time to have a mandatory sentence for people who sold drugs to kids, he was the tie-breaking vote that said no. In my view, we have to be much tougher on crime. We need longer minimum sentences. Now, the other side, the roots of crime. I, I was in favor of the crime bill. There's a lot of it that I think is fluff. I wish I could cut it out of there. But there is, however, the real root of crime we have to look at, and that is parents in homes teaching kids the, the anti-crime, the violence, the love, the respect for other people. We need to have a welfare system that doesn't pay kids to have kids. And we also have to have an education system that teaches kids the kind of character that's essential if we're going to have a crime-free society. Gentlemen, uh, this, well, this is such an important issue. I think we need to give just, you uh, each uh, another 30 response. seconds, if we uh, can. The, uh, the sentencing provisions, which are in force at the federal, give requirements for anyone that does provide uh, or sells drugs to children puts them in jail. And anyone that commits a crime with a gun goes to jail. That's in the federal. But no sentence. mandatory Wait sentence. A second. It's, it, it's prescribed time, Mr. Romney. You better uh, understand exactly what that is. I it do means that they do is. go to, uh, they, it means that they will go uh, to jail. Then why did but you vote against that probably, amendment? Probably because of the whole, uh, it's or, they're already going to, cha uh, to jail so, on that So part. the people who put that amendment up were just, were just out of touch with reality. No, they, it isn't a, a question. I yield to no one in terms of what to do about guns. I'd be interested whether you are for the banning of uh, the manufacture and description of Saturday night specials, whether you would support restricting handguns for teenagers, whether you would uh, support legislation for one gun a person uh, a month. Let's hear on those three issues where you stand on guns. If you'd like I'm to respond to that. I'm not yelling at anyone about guns in our society. Well, but, I know enough about you, it, Mr. Romney. You do know enough about it, uh, Senator. We've heard that before. That's, that's the last resort each time this, this question comes up, but it's not necessary here. The question was, why did you vote against an amendment requiring people who use guns in the commission of crimes to, pay, or to, to serve stiff because, additional sentences? Because the sentencing provisions on that I thought were sufficient. And in my okay. view, in my view, all that, right. That is and in all my view, and, and so and does and Judge Rehnquist. I, I don't Supreme care about Court what Judge. I don't, I don't care about what Judge Rehnquist Gentlemen, thinks. I me. care about what you think. And in my view, people who use guns in the commission of crimes should should have tough, mandatory sentences for them. It was put up in the Senate. Senator Kennedy took it out as the tie-breaking vote. I hate to cut this off, but we do have to move on. Sorry, Phil. Okay, Patricia Collins. Hi, I'm Patricia Collins. I'm from Sandwich. I have a question first for Senator Kennedy. Uh, Senator, recipients portrayed as the worst abusers of the welfare system are those whose circumstances derive from their substance abuse. Active addicts do not meet the able-bodied standard which triggers the workfare requirement. Therefore, those most abusive of the system are exempted from workfare. This seems inequitable. What alternative plan with time limits do you propose from them since you are a proponent of workfare? Well, I, I didn't hear the first part of the question. I didn't hear the... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that uh, recipients portrayed as the worst abusers... Recipients of... of welfare. Yeah. Uh, well, and so you're asking, 
in the, in the occasions of individuals <coughs> who are substance abusers who receive a, a welfare, what's my position? That oh, they don't no. fit the able-bodied. No, they don't fit. Work fair evolves around the able-bodied standard. There has to be, there is an able-bodied standard. I've heard you reference it yourself several times. But those people who we find are most abusive of the welfare system derive their circumstances from their substance abuse. They are not able-bodied, therefore, they will not be um, oh, uh, you know, covered by the work fair requirement. What, it's inequitable. Well, it's, uh, we had uh, Senator Cohen's uh, committee on investigations did a very uh, important investigation about the abuse, the substance abuse of people that were on welfare and made a series of recommendations which I support. I don't see how you can possibly continue welfare payments to individuals who are involved in substance uh, abuse. And so I, I support those recommendations uh, in terms of halting it. Uh, I don't know uh, how you could expect if there are substance abusers that they would fall into the able-bodied category. I, I'm just not familiar with that, uh, uh, that, th that, that, that provision, although I, I was, was a strong supporter of the, uh, the Cohen investigation and the recommendations that were made on this particular issue. It's uh, ridiculous to continue welfare payments <coughs> for people who are going to be substance abusers. So what alternative plan with well, time the, limits do you propose you try, for those uh, people to get them if, off welfare? I suppose if you have individuals who are uh, the, uh, in, uh, faced extremely unfortunate circumstances over a period, long period of time, I suppose what you try and do is get them free from the substance abuse to the extent that, uh, that you have that possibility. Now, and would you impose that, a time limit on that as you would well, with whatever, workfare? Whatever, I would take uh, the medically, whatever is uh, medically necessary on those, uh, those provisions. It's interesting that in the state and federal courts where you have about 65 percent of those that are in jail as a result of substance abuse, that those individuals uh, recover as well as those that take the program voluntarily. And so there's absolutely no reason that you can't require those individuals to take uh, the, that, uh, that particular program and hopefully free themselves. But I, I'm strongly opposed to extending uh, any uh, welfare payments to people that are substance abusers. Senator, I have to stop you there. Mr. Romney, <clears throat> you, you need some more time again. Well, Tricia, um, uh, we'd save a lot of money if we didn't extend any benefits to people who had substance abuse problems. Columbia University this June of 94 did a study of welfare moms to see how many had substance abuse problems. They found one out of four. So it's a massive problem. This is not just some isolated case where we can cut off benefits. And, uh, you know, we'll have people all over the street, little kids without moms at home. We can't just cut off the benefits. We've got to say, what are we going to do about this? In my welfare reform plan, I have called for drug testing of moms or of anyone signing up for, uh, for AFDC at the beginning of the program to see, is there an abuse problem? Now, is that punitive? I don't want it to be punitive. I want to understand if that money that we're going to be ha passing along to this mom is going to get to the child that needs it or not. And if not, if this mom has a problem, I want to get her in rehabilitation. It's going to cost about a billion dollars a year to do that. But I want to get her into rehabilitation. I want to get those tests done because I'm concerned about the children. If we have moms with drug abuse problems, what's going to happen to those kids? We've got to have the Department of Youth Services and others watching after those children to make sure that if this is a mom that's got a problem and she's in rehabilitation and we're taking care of her, that we're also watching those kids. And at some point, if she keeps having this trouble and keeps having this trouble, we're going to have to take the kids away, put them into homes that can ca care for them, foster homes until she's able to get over this terrible problem. All right, we're getting perilously close to the closing arguments. And you will be able to applaud very soon. But we have one more question. Hi, uh, I'm George Retoff. I'm a small businessman from Cambridge. I have a company, Metro Boston Appraisal there. Uh, good to see you again, gentlemen. Uh, Senator, um, on the front page of the Boston Globe a few days ago, uh, a book by Richard Burke, a former aide of yours, was uh, recounted. It's called The Senator, My Ten Years with Ted Kennedy. Uh, the author alleges that you and he shared cocaine in the 1970s and 80s that you engage in sexual harassment of uh, women's staffers. Now, come on, folks. Let me get the question in. That you engaged in uh, sexual harassment of uh, women's staffers uh, on your staff, uh, and that you had drinking problems. The Granted, the Senate Ethics Committee uh, found no uh, evidence of the uh, allegations, but my question is, have you ever used cocaine? Do you have a drinking problem? No, the answer to both is no. And uh, as you uh, well know, those were, uh, those were old allegations by a disgruntled former employee. 
of mine that was uh, reviewed in their entirety by the Ethics Committee, made up of Republicans as well as Democrats, and unanimously rejected them because they are completely false and without any uh, truth to them whatsoever. So, Do you have a question for Mr. Romney? Sure, I have a quick one. George, uh, George I don't want your question. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there. Suppose I'm a voter who demands that people who murder state troopers face the death penalty, who thinks that all Americans, rich, poor, and middle class, pay too much in taxes, and that women on welfare who have children out of wedlock should not be rewarded for, with uh, larger welfare payments to have more children. Simple question, if these are my core beliefs, who do I vote for, you or Mr. Kennedy? I think I will take that question. You clearly vote for me in a question like that. I believe in the death penalty for people who take the lives of state troopers or police or other innocent victims in a heinous way. I do believe also that we should not continue to pay more money to someone who's on welfare to have more children. I think we want to make sure that each additional child receives child, uh, uh, excuse me, health care, receives food stamps, but does not receive an additional cash payment. Uh, I'm not sure that I got all the rest of your points there, but uh, uh, you would, I would presume you would vote for me on that basis. All right. We are now at the point of closing arguments. Uh, in a coin toss that happened a week ago, Mr. Romney won and elected to go last. So Senator Kennedy will have the first closing statement. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank again the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald and Holyoke College for having uh, this forum. I welcome the fact that we were able to have this debate in the western part of our state. Uh, this uh, decision that are going to be made by the people of uh, Massachusetts in these next 10 days are not so much about Mr. Romney or myself. It's about themselves, their families, and their future. Whether they're going to have someone in the United States Senate that's going to work on the kinds of priorities that they care about, to strengthen our education system, to strengthen our training program, to be a voice and an effective voice for them to get a reform in our health care system once and for all that will attend to the problems of children, to working families, and to the seniors of uh, Massachusetts. I have been able to build those kinds of coalitions. I think Massachusetts is on the move. We've seen a decline in unemployment by three points. Those jobs aren't as good as the kind of jobs that I would like. I think that we ought to build on those building blocks and be able to see a Massachusetts that's growing and expanding and developing its, developing its economy. I want to represent you. I want to be on your side. I need your vote. I want your vote. I hope that you'll support me in the election. I thank you. Over the last year, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the state from festivals in Springfield to rallies in Fall River. And everywhere I go, people come up to me with a choked expression in their throat and will say to me something like, I'm living from paycheck to paycheck. I can't save any money. I can't even dream. What happens if my company leaves Massachusetts? What happens if I lose my job or I get sick? How can I retire on the money I'm, I'm hardly putting aside? What's the future for my children? In my view, one of the great American tragedies is being portrayed right now, and we're seeing it. And that is that government is growing, all these programs are growing, all the spending is growing, all the taxing is growing, and yet the American middle class is getting crushed and squeezed, and they just can't handle it anymore. I am running for that reason. The heart of my campaign is to make sure that, not as a politician, but as a father, a small businessman, a citizen of the same state you're a citizen of, I go to Washington with the intent of changing things there. These programs haven't worked. I was in Dorchester not long ago. Someone said, this is Kennedy country, and they handed a sign to me in front of my face. And I looked around, and I saw boarded up buildings, and I saw jobs leaving, and I said, it looks like it. And I said, we need, we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we have a United States Sen Senator who has experience in bringing jobs, in building our economy, who will not continue to keep raising taxes on the middle class. I will not do that. Someone who's committed to a balanced budget, someone who is committed to eradicating crime, to helping education, someone who's committed that that type of country doesn't spread across our state, but rather that we become once again the robust, energetic leader of the entire nation and the entire nation of the free world. I love this state. I am so thankful for the chance I've had to run like this. I hope you'll support me. I need your vote. Thank you very much.
still do have a little bit of business to do here, and that is to thank Senator Kennedy and Mr. Romney and the members of our citizen panel and all of you for being with us tonight and for all of you who have been watching and listening throughout the state. Thanks very much. We hope you'll vote. Thank you and good night. Hey, Mitt. Good to see you. Thank you, Senator. Good, good to see you. you. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Tricia, good to see you again. Thank you. Harvey, didn't Thank get you all so your much. Questions, I want to hear the nice rest of your questions. You. Thanks a lot. Nice to see you. Oh, Thank Thanks. you for the comment and the question. Thank you, Robert. We've been watching live coverage of a debate between U.S. Senate candidates in Massachusetts, incumbent Democrat Edward Kennedy and Republican Mitt Romney. This was the second debate between the two candidates during this race. This debate was organized by the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald. We'll replay this debate on C-SPAN later around 10 minutes after 11 Eastern, 8.10 p.m. Pacific time.